first ask you, um, Dr. Yelder, if you've been interviewed before by other organizations or for other articles or publications. Um, I guess over over time I have not as uh, in this kind of taped form. I've, um, uh, I've I've been interviewed quite a bit by students um, interested in you know what your background is and what you do that sort of thing. In fact, I guess. One of them I remembered was my son major, majoring in communications. So I was his subject for a TV uh-huh. interview that was not too good. <laughs> so was the interview actually a broadcast on TV? Uh, they played it back as part of their school, as uh-huh. part of the school project, yes. So I've, I've been involved in, in that kind of thing over well, time. Well, if there are other interviews that, that are available, I think uh, the archives would certainly be interested in maybe compiling those and keeping those together so that mm-hmm. one of these days when, when people want to know what happened in Los Angeles, they would have yeah. that, that information to, to look at. Mm-hmm. I, I, think there is, I know I have one or two that was done, particularly on TV, uh, that was related not so much to my personal experience, but to activities. That were that seemed to be going on at a given time, and um, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, mm-hmm. What that has been taken in the past? Well, as you know, you're on the board for the uh, Social Welfare Archives. There's a lot of interest in, in being able to capture the history of social work, and so much of history is really the history of people. That's true. And I'm wondering that we, if we might start with how you happened to go into social work and what the factors were that led you to choose that as a profession. Mm. Well, I guess in some ways it was, uh, you know, what what were the opportunities that happened to be available at the time? Um, having, um, as a child, I grew up in the Middle West and came to California, uh, went to UCLA, um, in those days, there was not a lot of what recruitment for school and uh, applying to a lot of different colleges and all. And I came to UCLA because my mother had moved to California uh, prior to that time uh, because of the depression on the in the Midwest, East Coast, and uh, had really kind of established a home here for us, and so I found myself suddenly at UCLA, and I was very interested in anthropology, sociology, and I think my push in those days was toward social action, and the closest thing to anything that resembled social action in those days had to do with sociology, and that's why I uh, majored in sociology not thinking necessarily of social work as I have experienced it, but more in terms of, I guess, the movement for change. Um, What were some of the issues of the day that that led to your interest in social action? Well, I think the uh, probably one of the most critical things for me, is remember this was the uh, time of World War II, uh, with many kinds of things happening. And uh, but the particular thing, I think, had a lot to do with segregation. In my own early experience, I had gone to a segregated elementary school, which was this not necessarily a negative thing in Kansas. This is in Kansas. In Kansas. A high school was integrated. Um, the quality of the education... As far as I remember back, there were no distinctions except you might be put into a track for home economics. Fortunately, that did not happen to me because of my parents, my grandparents. Um, but when the high school was over, then there was a decided difference in job opportunities. And so really the option was to go to college and out of that, I, I was very aware of how um, segregation had created problems in, in, for uh, people of color. So that I think that, uh, along with World War II, with a lot of changes, people were moving around, 
Um, there were just a lot of things happening at that time. I don't think I was really astute as to all the problems and all the incidents that had occurred in the past. But um, I think I was just kind of brought up on the idea that people should push for their rights. And the theme of that was, you know, that you should be educated. That if you had a fairly good education, you might have, you'd be prepared for job opportunities. Um, and so I think that was the kind of climate um, at that time. Um, when I arrived at UCLA, people were very conscious of things like uh, restrictive covenants in, in California, which were very new to me, um, segregated eating places. Um, this is in, in uh, California? In California, in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles 1942, 43. And I think those are the things that directed me toward an interest in social work and concern for people. And um, So you personally experienced the segregation and the prejudice? And yes. Yeah, yes, I had, and I think it was uh, not a heavy amount. I think I was a fortunate person in having a minimum of that. I think part of it was protection as far as from the, uh, for the family, from the family. Um, having grown up in the Middle West, I think, with uh, recognition that you could accomplish whatever you wanted to in education, that was a plus but I also was very aware of the other side. I was very conscious of and didn't really understand um, what had happened in California as a result of World War II and the Pearl Harbor issue and the relocation of Japanese families. At that time, I didn't know anybody. But I heard in the neighborhood, the community that I lived in and moved, everybody talked about the loss and what had happened to people. So there were all these things stirring at that time. There was a very militant newspaper called the California Eagle that wrote, uh, uh, in fact, it was considered almost a communist paper. It was a, a woman editor who wrote a lot about all these kinds of issues. And so I was very aware. Of, I, w I just was kind of surrounded in terms of the community. You really looked to your education as a way of equipping yourself, empowering yourself to to see what you can do. How did then that that uh, degree in sociology was it sociology? It was sociology. Or? It was sociology with an emphasis, believe it or not, in um, social work because it talked about things like the opportunities. They talked about were places like the probation department. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Bureau of Public Assistance, um, field, the field of corrections, and some, just a little bit of uh, something about community organizations. But it, was, it, was, it was not nearly as widespread or as developed um, as we might have thought. And Dr. Yalder, after graduation from UCLA, did you go directly into graduate school or did you work? <laughs> I tried, uh, should I say, to go to graduate school. And I guess, you know, as I think back over it, uh, the lines of communication were rather interesting because I somehow found and learned about through advisement at UCLA about the School of Social Work. And I w graduated because I went to school continuously during those four years. I think I was 20 when I graduated. So I wasn't sure I could even get a job in a public institution. All I knew was that I could take a test. I actually went over and applied to go to USC. And I remember so vividly meeting uh, Dr. Arlene Johnson mm. in, in school social work. And the first thing she said was, how old are you? And I said, I'll be 21 <laughs> in December. <laughs> and she said go out and get some experience. Uh, so that was my uh, interest. And I took her literally, because from there I went really immediately, uh, went down and took an exam, or I guess I had taken an exam, and I was called to work for L.A. County. And uh, as I said, I think my impression of what social work was all about was social action. I was not that 
aware of and was not that knowledgeable about casework. I must say that uh, some of this kind of evolved because I had a part-time job at the YMCA. And during the war years, it was hard to find people to work. And I lived around the corner from the Y. And I was a friend to the de- director's daughter. And through her, I got a job answering the telephone at the Y. So that was my social agency yeah. <laughs> first experience. And that's what they said when I got to L.A. County. Uh, she doesn't know anything about casework, but she has worked. She knows how to answer the telephone. <laughs> well, what were you working, you said, for L.A. County? What, what department or what program? I was in, the, at that, in those days, it is now known as Department of Public Social Services. In those days, it was known as the Bureau of Public Assistance. And the office was located down on Santee street um it was just a big kind of warehouse with floors and i remember going in for this interview and the director was so busy she said um just report tomorrow uh or come back for an interview and i remember saying i have to notify my employer and um that's how i got my first job and i found myself the next morning sitting at a desk with some cases and uh, have impressed her with something because she I, hired you right on the spot like that. I th- it, wa- it wasn't me. It was the, the need for bodies to work. Uh-huh. I think the, the demand uh, for providing services and working with people at that time was very limited. And having a uh, bachelor's degree was um, really uh, considered, you know, useful. Um so this is now in the late 1940s. Mid, mid 45. In fact, um, it was um, 1945 is when I got my first job. And I worked on that job for about a year, taking a course at USC in social work. Um, one was called Medical Information for Social Workers, and the other was uh, I had to do with um, Psychiatric Information for Social Workers. So this is in the, uh, the graduate school? In the graduate school of uh-huh. social work. I took these courses because you could take a class if you were working as a social worker, part-time. And uh, the county at that time, you know, it seems, as I think back, it was a very, it was, uh, Los Angeles County was very forward-looking mm-hmm. in those times. And they had a, a stipend program. And for... A year of service, you could have a year of graduate work. Mm -hmm. So I took my year of experience and reapplied to USC and got admitted for as a first-year student and completed my certificate, did my field work in L.A. County, um, working with uh, basically with families and children. And with that one-year certificate... um, I came back to work. work. So Dean Johnson was the dean at She was the dean at, the, at USC at the time. You said it was a one-year certificate program. Yeah, it was a it one-year year certificate. Two years they had the two years master's, but by completing at the end of one year, you receive a certificate. Mm. And that's what I received, thinking that each year after I pay back my year's commitment, I will go back to USC. And I think it went up until, I think you had like five or six years to use those same courses Mm -hmm. to go on into the second year. And each time something else would happen, I got a different assignment. In fact, I became a supervisor in L.A. County with uh, working with the General Relief and the Aid to Needy Children program. And... um, that's pretty impressive because my guess is that there weren't very many black social workers, let alone supervisors. There were very few, uh, but I was very, it, it was a really, uh, you know, I always say Los Angeles is like a small town. The file that I really learned my social work from, and if there's anything like socialization, this really happened. The minister, the assistant pastor of our church, his wife was a social worker mm-hmm. working in L.A. County. And when I came in as a new worker, I got her file. 
Mm. Not because someone said, you know Mrs. Branham, you can work, but that was the file that happened to be open because she got promoted to work in adoptions. Uh, and because she were, she was a, a, a specialist in adoptions. And um, that's kind of how I followed. But you're right. It was a very, there were very few uh, uh, people of color uh, at all. Uh, and But interestingly enough, the people who did work there, there was a fair number. It was like an entry where there wasn't the bias. So if you had a bachelor's degree, you could be hired. And I think that, and you, you see, you remember that that was 1945, so there was still, what, the kind of the boom of the war years, the job opportunities and that sort of thing. So this made for um, a spot, and it was really kind of a, a training period place for probation. Some people went to probation, and some people went into uh, education. From that. So I it was. The word, um, black, and you use the term person of color, uh-huh. and it's it's interesting. How do you see? Do you see yourself as a? And I'm not even sure how to ask it. A black social worker, an African American social worker. Uh, well, I guess I I see myself as a social worker who happens to be an African American, uh, uh, and I think that's how I'd have to define myself. Um, because I've always been involved. I think that was one of the advantages of going to UCLA, was being in a pretty diverse background. There were not a lot of um, blacks at UCLA. Um, and I was trying to think of, and I know absolutely no Latinos that I knew as to. Asians, I didn't know at all obviously during the time that I matriculated there. But um, in the county, there was diversity. Because after my first year, I had a unit of people, and we were the UN. I had people like Louise Yamasaki. I don't know whether you know Louise or not. Uh, You know Reverend Yamasaki, who was a minister here for years. Yes, Yes. uh, and it was his, and that she was in that unit, uh, the unit clerk was from Hawaii and happened to be Chinese. Um, the um, uh, the other unit clerk was black. Um, I remember vividly there was a girl named Lutsky, who was Jewish, and um, a girl from Wisconsin who really kind of represented what she I think she was either Swedish. And one girl that I don't really know, he said that she would have been the represented white America because she had a southern accent. And she used to come to me and say, uh, Miss J, they don't like me because I have a southern accent. People don't like me because of that. But we were this unit, and we were all about the same age. We got in trouble from time to time and because uh, uh, they felt we didn't follow all the things we were supposed to. But it was a hard-working Group and we got interested in each other, in terms of our background and what we did. And um, I think that it was that was one of the kind of the real high points in my work experience, and probably why I use terms like people of color and uh, that type of thing. Um, and so, um, one of the things I would look at, of course, is how the early years, how your first jobs and your experiences affected then the, the rest of your professional mm-hmm. career. Mm-hmm. After that job then, what uh, what was next for you? Well, let's see. When I left, when I worked in L.A. County as a um, supervisor, I then went back to graduate school. Mm-hmm. And I had, my field experience was with VA. Mm-hmm. This was back at USC. At USC, uh-huh. back at USC. And that was about 1952. Um Interestingly enough, that was kind of the uh, time when the government was offering, the federal government was offering stipends. But I happened to come in on, uh, at the time, when veterans were receiving 
the educational benefits. Mm -hmm. And they had an, inc an additional number of credits because of their veteran status. And when I applied to USC, I also applied for a stipend from VA and was told I would get one. When I arrived at VA, they said, um, we were so sure you would get the money, but Congress has acted and they cut the allowances in half. There were two positions, so the veteran got the position. All because of his veteran status. His veteran status. Points were added to the scores. The scores. So you may have been equally or perhaps yeah, more qualified. Right. The additional points made him, him the person that he was, was He was selected. Um, so I, I really kind of ran into that as part of my whole educational experience. I was determined to go to, uh, to get my degree mm -hmm. uh, because I felt like I wanted to get beyond uh, uh, the uh, Bureau of Public Assistance. Interestingly enough, um, the hardest part for me was that I just didn't have any money. So I actually did my second year of graduate work living at home. Um, and I could, I, so I knew what it meant not to have any money to spend. I was able to take care of my tuition. Of course, tuition in those days was, it sounded tremendous, but I think we were paying something like maybe 15 or 20 dollars a unit. Still, that's quite a bit more than it was at UCLA. Yeah, UCLA was, what, $30? A, a semester. <laughs> a probably. semester, yeah, it was, it was. So, that, and I guess USC went to $10, that's what it was. Um, but the interesting thing was that I was so determined to complete that master's, and I think that that push for being trained and not being sort of half and half was, was very critical for me. Plus, I think the other thing that was so important was that I was in a climate, even in public agency, which has been, you know, really, uh, what, bad mouth over the years. The people there were very encouraging about education. The supervisors I had, the people had a close tie with USC. So there was a large training unit with that group. And I think that climate was the thing that made, made all the difference in the world. And I thought, oh, if, as soon as I can get through this, I'm, I'm going to leave the county. And actually, when I returned, I moved into staff training. And um, it was, the difference in the feeling was I could leave if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, I would see more opportunities than I'd ever had. And your job then was to, to provide training for to training. social workers. I, social workers. I started with students, and the first program that I was involved in, which uh, uh, was so interesting to me, was the undergraduate having field experiences for undergraduate students from about five or six of the colleges in this area. I was part of, really, it was a, like an experiment. I don't think the graduate schools thought a lot of undergraduate social work training, but I became familiar with schools like Pepperdine, um, Cal State was just uh, coming forth, uh, Long Beach State was beginning to do things with an emphasis in social work. Um, I went to uh, Pomona College. Um, um, all of the schools around in this area, I was familiar with them. And I said at that time, because I got married in 1954, and I guess this was about 1956 or 7. Um, in fact, I was pregnant. And I said, well, I know where I'm, my child is going to college. I can check all the schools, because I was looking at the undergraduate experience. So we had a program just for that. And to me, that was really a kind of a turning point for many people. I also had uh, a unit of students from USC, students who were in field work um, for L.A. County. Um, then in that same period and around that time with that job, I organized and we were part of a training, I guess you would call it like a training institute because Within a six-month period, I think we had trained about 
400 social workers. Wow. And it was a continuous program, and the person were in the program for like 90 days. And they not only had, we had classes and follow-up, but we all, and then they had some practical experience with a small case load. It was revolutionary. So you know that did not last uh, uh, beyond that uh, kind of six-month period. But that made for, um, you know, I think it was really a cutting edge for training and orientation. So, and I was part of that um, whole project and coordinated that. Um, it was cutting, you mentioned it was cutting edge, so that was pretty innovative. At the yeah, time. it was innovative. There was because the the training was so intensive, and it was it was really not so much the number of cases or the number of clients, but a few clients that you did or you taught in depth work. With. That's right. That's right. And I mean, so the the people really got more than how to fill out forms. And I think that that, too, as I said, was very different. At that same, during that same period, and kind of on the hub of that, I guess, around the 60s, was the demonstration projects with the state. The state was funding special kinds of programs. And I think that was the area, I think that was really kind of the height of trying to do things uh, to improve uh, uh, services in a public So this is setting. In the, uh, the public social service setting, the public welfare yes, setting? Yes, that's right. It's in the public welfare setting, which is, seems unusual. And I think that uh, the thing that I think back over in terms of that practice and working with in terms of supervision was that we saw many people either decide they wanted no part of social work and they moved out of it and, but we also saw uh, people who really became involved and dedicated. If they didn't move into management and that type of thing, they did go on to graduate school. So, so many of those people we know around today in the past, I, I've watched them uh, grow. So I guess my whole thing was that um, I got really involved in education and training. That, that's how my career lines ran. That's right, and you distinguish yourself as uh, in the profession as a teacher and trainer, and mm -hmm. certainly early on in your career you were doing that. Were there things that you you introduced as concepts in training at that time? Um, probably at that time, there I couldn't say that I introduced the concepts, but I think that probably the um, the thing I was a, a part of was the uh, setting up a policy and program that allowed for extensive training, staff development. And I think the uh, thing that I really had an opportunity to do was to also be a part of some of the intensive training that was done by the state of California. That is, I worked with them. Um, interestingly enough, uh, in the early... 60s, the, um, I moved from working for uh, DPSS, as it was about to be called, to working for the state of California as a training consultant. And I learned that through working in the Division for the Blind. I worked with a uh, person who happened to be blind as a summer assignment um, to develop uh, some programs and materials. And I guess mostly what I did during that early period, you asked what I did that was innovative, was that we did a training film with the state on interviewing. You mean a, a film? Like film, a movie, training, like a movie. Uh, it was summer. actually done with, in coordination with USC, uh, a, a person from USC. I remember and that. We so both, it, it, um, uh, we were both... Um, young mothers with kids about five years old. And we didn't know what to do with our kids, so they became part of the they became a part of the film. They were in the in the waiting room. It was called Techniques of Interviewing. And we actually had a, a waiting room. We used uh, staff to act as the clients and we had a script. That's and um, so it was done. Film and, uh, and 
as, as training. Yeah. yeah, this was a regular old-fashioned film. You know, it's on one of these big old projectors. Uh, tapes and projectors. And we all, I laughed about that so because uh, you could see these kids moving in and out on the floor, and they were our kids. And that was our babysitting. Well, that's the way we uh, uh, looked after them. But uh, we did two films on working, interviewing, and um, in consultation with the state Department of Social Welfare, Department of Public Assistance, and uh, USC. And the person do, who did this was a part of the faculty, the cinema department at USC. Mm. And that was something that was different, and it was very exciting, and it was very creative. And that was the first time I saw my name listed as uh, Josephine Yelder Consultant, mm. you know, and uh, so that using um, visual materials and, and doing um, non-traditional things, things other than lecturing, was really a part of my experience. Yeah. As so that's I... That's 40 years before uh, George Lucas, I guess. <laughs> huh? so you, well, you whatever, yeah. The, uh, the yeah, we, we were... Yeah. Right, yes, yeah. so. She was doing some independent work and had gotten this contract with the state, and I was selected to work with her. Um, as I moved to, um, left the county, I worked for the state. I had an interesting time I, uh, in terms of not so much, you know, contributing to policy or whatever, but doing innovative things. And one of the um, things that we did was I was hired by the state. I was supervised by the USC School of Social Work. Um, and I had my unit in Pasadena, California. Uh, students who came from all over California who wanted to go on to graduate school. And this was done by, with the uh, stipends provided by the State Department of Social Welfare. So there I engaged in uh, supervising students mm -hmm. in a county setting. And that, um, I guess that lasted for about two, three years. Uh, and then one day I got there and they said, you know, we're, it's over. Mm -hmm. Funds have been cut. And um, from there, I got this call from Malcolm Stinson in Los Angeles from SC saying, I understand that your job is about to go, and I said, it's gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he said, we would like to have you uh, take over a child welfare unit. The Children's Bureau is funding, mm -hmm. and you would be on USC's faculty. Wow, this is the dean then that followed uh, uh, Dean Johnson. That's so right, dean that's Stinson. right. Uh -huh. Yes, Dean Stinson. And what we set up with that program, uh, I had been a part of it because it was in Pasadena. So I got to know him mm -hmm. through the students uh, that we had uh, from the state. Mm -hmm. And he maneuvered this contract that we had, which was state, county, and USC. Mm -hmm. um, I got the appointment with the Children's Bureau, and, uh, through the Children's Bureau, Annie Lee Sandusky, who is a really a, a very well-known woman in child welfare. Uh, June Brown and I had heard her years before when we were workers, just went to see her. We kept the units in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I think I felt most innovative about was developing the concept of a field work center mm -hmm. so that all the agencies, the students who were placed in Pasadena, I worked with them as a liaison mm -hmm. person. And so we had... Uh, uh, partly non-agency, unstructured experience in field work. And that allowed them to see what was going on in the community, to look at certain kinds of issues uh, and projects that were not a part of the traditional child guidance, DPSS, YWCA program. And one of those was to um, uh, look at groups who were kind of underserved and one happened to be a Spanish-speaking group that lived. They were invisible. Because mm -hmm. in those days, they said, oh, there were no uh, Spanish-speaking people to speak of in Pasadena. It 
turns out that working with these mothers, the students got a chance to really kind of help them get in touch with some services at the Y. And we did a project up in the north end with um, backyard mothers, mothers who uh, the houses, the streets didn't look too good, but they were organized. We had the junior leaguers come and help them clean up and change the community. And also the mothers uh, had their children supervised. So those were kind of really innovative projects that you could not have done under strictly public monies, like with public assistance. But with the school's involvement, uh, that was started. So I was part of the first group of what they called clinical social work. Um, it was a, like what a clinical professor of social work, which was so a that, fancy name for field work. So that may have been the first, uh, the first time social workers were, were referred to perhaps as clinical social workers. Uh, I don't know that it was uh, that I think in private practice and in the private agencies they used this term they were trying to find a term that would distinguish us from the regular faculty mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I had a faculty appointment which I thought was really unusual but that's what the government required mm -hmm. so that was one of those kind of first uh, innovative things that I was involved in and you know the time when you begin to, when I go back over this, I think now this happened in the '60s, and here I was at the '70s, and I had been there what seven years. It's like if you're an assistant professor, you either get promoted up or out, mm -hmm. and that was kind of the turning time when social work began to think we ought to have people on our faculty with doctorates. Mm -hmm. And so I had audited some doctoral classes and um, made a decision that I would uh, go back to school. So see, this is the third time. Certificate, master's, mm -hmm. and then I went back in uh, 1970. Um, and and was this back to USC, USC or UCLA? I was going to USC, but they had not uh, established their uh, DSW, program. DSW program. When I went to USC for my master's program, they had not established a master's program. I, each time, I, I, in fact, I actually wrote a letter to, to UCLA asking when they would start a master's in social work. Before they had one. Before they had one. Well, so maybe your letter led to Yeah, the, maybe the, uh, I, I, I like to think that. <laughs> I like to think that. But I really sort of, my loyalty moved over to USC. And uh, again, this whole pattern of when you uh, don't have many resources and you uh, are kind of dependent on, you know, how are you going to pay for this? Here I am now with two children. My husband is... Is working, he worked for the government, for the post office, for many years. And here I am with this newfangled USC tuition facing us. And I said, I would love to go to school, but I have only limited means for going to graduate school. And that's how I got into aging. They offered stipends for aging, as my field had been family and child welfare. Uh -huh. So, so you were ready to go back and work on your doctorate, but uh, <coughs> no money. I guess the realities were such that you didn't have the money, and USC's tuition was going up even more. It, well, it was. It was. It had gone crazy. But through the school of social work and the uh, gerontology program at that time, there was uh, Barbara Solomon had a joint appointment mm -hmm. with them, and uh, she was the chairperson of my dissertation committee, and I took courses in aging. And that was the one thing that contributed, I think, uh, in many ways to my growth that kept me away from... How's our tape going? Okay. Yeah. We have about yeah. uh, maybe 10 more minutes. Okay. That kept me from feeling... What's a good word? Uh, so incestuous that I'm talking to the same people again for the third time around in terms of teachers. I did take a number of courses at the Andrews Gerontology Center. And I focused my um, research 
uh, it was more on behavior than on clinical practice, uh, looking at um, generational relationships in the black family. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a culmination of kind of like a whole lifetime of work and experience. And um, again, I get through all the courses, get through all of that, and I no longer have a job. At that period, SC uh, had been notorious for hiring its own. Just about everybody who got a doctorate got on the faculty. This is now in the mid-60s? Yes, this is the uh, 70s. Mid-70s. I completed my work in 75. It took me five years to get through the whole thing. I got a job at uh, at Pepperdine in 1973 um, to teach full-time. They had an undergraduate social work program, and they thought they might like a graduate program. That was just prior to the time that they decided that they'd better desert the inner city and went to Malibu. Oh. So those plans kind of went down the tubes, but it gave me a job and a, a good experience in what I would look at as um, working with um, undergraduates in sociology with a social work mm-hmm. emphasis. And so I sort of became kind of what a, a recruitment base for people going into graduate school in social work um, uh, and taught. And this is where I think the emphasis, based on my background from aging and also the focus on the black family, that I was able to develop uh, courses and really got much more involved in multicultural education. So that's the kind of the whole cycle of uh, what my education was like and what my career was like. I guess it's been a, a mixture. And as I look back over it, I'm, I'm glad I didn't go through um, taking things course by course, you know, finishing your education, then having a career, and then having a family. But they're all kind of laced together like a, a cafeteria line where you could pick up whatever you needed as you went along. So um, that's been that's been kind of what my experience has been. And, um, There's a question that I have that's probably more about you than, than the profession. You know, many people um, kind of follow along what others have, have set forth. It sounds like you're in the course of your, your social work career, you have been creative and innovative. Um, for example, the, the issue of the films. What do you think of your own, your own background or training, perhaps, led you to, to be able to be creative and innovative like that? Mm, I think probably I, I would have relate that to family. Mm. Uh, family interests, support, um, that um, there was always something um, of that, I think, in, in the family as, as I know it. Um, I'm thinking of um, my... Um, my grandmother, who uh, brought her two little girls and her family, following her family, to Kansas. My mother probably told you about that. Um, was, um, I guess her level of education would have been about the third grade. But she was able to it be involved. She worked for a family. She worked. She was able to do things that were creative. So if you didn't have something, you found innovative ways to uh, kind of put it together. This is your grandmother. My grandmother. And that's and that's who I spent a lot of time with. And I remember um, watching her as she did things, knowing that she, um, she didn't read that much, but she could look at something and she would do something with whatever she had. And I have, you know, sitting here in the living room, if you see all that, I have early confusion. But uh, these chairs belonged to her, and they were, and she covered them up until uh, we brought them out here. And so that's something like she would do that kind of work. I was around a person like that. My mother, who uh, went to college, um, was in home economics. 
she taught home economics uh, during the time of the Depression, as I understand it. And as she came out here, she was able, the jobs where she worked, she was always able to do something that made it special. The jobs were never looked upon as demeaning. It was always, uh, that did not make you a demeaned person. You made the job uh, more exciting. And I think that's part of what uh, what influenced me a lot. That's impressive that your mother, who is now 88, uh -huh. uh, went to college. She um, went to college. This is done during the, was it the 40s? The 20s. 20s. She 20s. went to school in the 20s. Um, my father, I found, I went back to Kansas, and um, although my parents were not together uh, not long after I was born, um, my father was um, an educator and taught school in the South. And uh, during the USO period, he, uh, in World War II, he uh, was an entertainer. And um, I found his uh, yearbook. I guess he finished uh, high school like in 1920. And in this book are all the students. His last name, my maiden name is Jordan. Everybody is in the book, but he's at the back of the book. There's about three black men who graduated from high school, and they're all at the end of the book. Well, why, why should Jordan be at the end of the because, book? Well, because he was black. What state was this? This is Kansas. In Kansas? In Kansas. What year was this? This was like 1920, oh. 21. And um, I, spout, I got this from my um, uh, cousin, uh, you know, on the paternal side of the family, they had kept a lot of records and things, so they gave me this book, and that's that was one of the things I uh, saw. Um, so that I guess we're part, of, that would be the other thing that contributed, that we didn't have money, but there was a lot of aspiration for achievement, a lot of support. So I would say on both sides of the family, that was a very uh, critical kind of thing. And uh, so I, I think it was kind of the encouragement of the community. The first scholarship I had, I got from a little town, the little town in Kansas, the, the Women's Bridge Club. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess gave me $35, and that was a lot of money yeah. uh, to go to school. My church was responsible for my getting money here for scholarship. So I think it's that kind of support community, family and community support that... Uh, was kind of a driving force. You were a very modest person, though. You, uh, rather than saying, I did this all myself, you give credit to others who were well, I, I could, to yeah. what to what you become today. And it sounds like clearly uh, education has been very, very important mm -hmm. for you, for your parents and your grandparents. Mm -hmm. and it certainly has uh, resulted in tremendous, I think, uh, changes that, that you helped bring about. Yeah, well, it's... Uh, it's in, been an exciting time to be alive and uh, to uh, look at the experiences. And I think um, when I was talking with my children, we were commenting about, oh, this has been a few years back. Uh, they were uh, a part of a Friendship Day Camp, um, some of the other groups. And we talked about why we have a lot of friends who are from different ethnic backgrounds. And I asked them how, you know, how did they come about this? And they said, well, you never did tell us that we had to be friends with certain people, but we just saw a lot of people around. And it was more like what they observed us doing. And my husband was the same same way in terms of his um, uh, being involved with people and uh, that type of thing. So it's been a, that's been a very positive. We're going to wrap this first part up. Okay. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been real gratifying to hear how... You, the person, have become, uh, I guess, the influences that have led you to this mm -hmm, point. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do the next time is talk more about uh, maybe policies and, and other issues and, and changes okay. that you, you've seen and the fact that you've, uh, you've helped bring about. Okay. Four, this is uh, side two of a interview with uh, Professor Josephine Yelder. Well, that must have been nice to be there with all of Edmund's friends.
Keith and Sam. Oh, yeah. We had worked together, but we had not seen each other for so long. And uh, several, a uh, number of people, some of these people who have been very supportive of our uh, archive mm -hmm. project. And I met her brothers, whom I had never met before, you know. Oh, where did we leave off? Where we? Well, we were, I think, talking about your career and in the field. Mm -hmm. And it's been fascinating hearing your your story and the, the different uh, different projects and the programs you've been involved with. Suppose we were to ask you what. What you found in your experience as a social worker that's been the most gratifying, mm -hmm. professionally and, and personally, what would you say uh, about some of those experiences? Well, you know, it's, it's really it's very hard. Um, one of the things I recall um, talking about was the fact that um, the uh, along with, of course, serving people and seeing people do well and feeling that something you did might be effective, I think it was the, um, the supportiveness and the relationships, the collegial relationships. I remember people used to talk about L.A. County, all your work for the county, or they say something, you know, especially uh, like the Bureau of Public Assistance or something. And I kept thinking, but... The people were great. The people were great. There were policies. There were things that over which um, you know we were not as uh, there was not the same kind of militancy. I think that you might find uh, today. But there was a kind of persistence. But the people who worked there seemed to be interested in each other and also interested in, them, in what they did on the job. And that that's probably the thing that has uh, uh, been a thread throughout um, my career, I think especially now, of course, in retrospect, immediately you think about um, uh, meeting students, seeing students, and since that was a really big part of my mm -hmm. career, which was in student um, training and staff development, mm -hmm. and I had never thought of uh, that as, quote, a social work career, but it really had the the advantages, even though it was a, a staff rather than a line position, it, it still, it, it, I think it supported the influence, probably of social work almost more than anything else than, that I've done. When you started out in direct service and, of course, ended up in teaching. That's right. Contributing, That's really, to the education of many more students. Mm -hmm. Has it been very often that students come back and say, you know, Professor Yelder, I thought I'd come back and say hi and thank yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. It, it happens. It, you know, even now, since having been out of out of so-called really very being very active in the last four years, uh, students I had um, uh, many years ago, our trainees, have reminded me that they were a part of that program, and I think. Um, I went to Atlanta to a social work conference, and um, I was on the national board at the time. Had not, and I think I did something at a workshop, but I really did not feel that I knew a lot of people there or anything. So when they introduced us, uh, who were there as part of the board, the national board, uh, right after that, a woman came up to me, whom I did not have as a student. But she reminded me that I had been in a conference in Denver and had talked to her about social work and saying, well, you know, you start when you're ready. You may not be fresh out of college and then you want to go. And she came to tell me that she was now, at that time, a first-year student mm -hmm. in the graduate school. And that was really very gratifying that she would take the time to come back and um, tell me that. So I've had that happen quite often, and even in more recent years, uh, students, when I worked with the undergraduate students, um, I think that was especially good. I taught a seminar, a freshman seminar, on the caring and helping professions. Of course, it was modeled after, and my main message was social work, but I had other people come, and um, a number of students from that 
has talked about how they found their way into uh, social work careers. And that kind of thing. So that's been very sad about that trip. Thinking back in your your training and teaching years, is there anything that that distinguishes your teaching that you have tried to emphasize with your students in training? Mm, let's see. What was uh, you're saying? Any you mean a particular style or? Uh, I suppose students were in a room talking, and they were all former students of yours. And they said, you know, Professor Yelder always taught us to. What do you think they might say about your teaching? Well, you know, I think probably one of the things I think would be um, not to give up readily in terms of working with people, uh, that there is, there's a need for a kind of persistence. I don't think, uh, I mean aggressiveness, but a kind of persistence in uh, really try, helping the person uh, toward uh, reaching um, a goal. Um, another, I think, uh, kind of area that would be very important would be not to set a limit on what they think their potential might be. I think one of the things that I've always been concerned about is that, that people are so easily uh, discouraged, uh, especially academically and particularly in pursuing um, education as such, that many times they uh, sort of minimize or think that they can't do things. So I think those are probably two things that I would uh, uh, think of that would come out very, very uh, uh, that would be most forceful, I think, and um, that's my perception. Mm -hmm. Would be that, and um, probably just the general, overall kind of acceptance of of people in, uh, in terms of where they are. You know, in your responses, you seldom refer to issues of the African-American social worker or the black family, mm. and yet you probably are one of the outstanding black social workers in the country. Mm. One of the interesting things that I, that I sense about, about you is that there is not that, that edge, sometimes that, that anger that, that I, I hear from people that have been uh, poorly treated in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about some um. of those issues? You know, I think that probably, um, yeah, I have a very, you're right, I have a very special interest in uh, uh, the African-American family, the black family. I'm concentrating very much now on uh, intergenerational ties. And I guess the thing that, um, I probably do that because that probably represented what I would consider the, uh, the healing side that the family was so supportive. Uh, in, in my earliest years, I remember, um, you know, receiving that kind of care and caring and support. Not that the family denied uh, that there were all these injustices uh, or that things happened that did not work too well, but I guess two things that they kind of provided was, um, one, uh, that did not make me or did not make us less of a person. And at the same time, um, there was, um, and it was a strong identification with our heritage and that type of thing. It was not done with denial, but um, I guess coming up in a, a community that was kind of middle, sort of semi-integrated, um, I was encouraged to compete to feel that you know, I was just as important as anybody else. And I think that came from the family. Along with other people in my uh, life experience that seemed to come that same way, but I've always felt um, that my family supported me. So this includes your, your father and your mother? My father and mother, my grandparents. Um, uh, I grew up in a community, in fact, when I was doing a review of my mother's life, we were talking about how many people had the family name of Williams. That was her 
mother's maiden name, and I said, there were so many Williams in the town, and we were probably related mm -hmm. to three-fourths mm -hmm. of them. So there was a kind of extended family. Uh, you know, there's a, a, an African proverb that it takes a whole um, village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. And in that community, uh, you were raised by the entire community. Both It was both somewhat segregated and somewhat not, but wherever you were, the school, the church, and the home was kind of the center of um, all activities. So that there, it was a kind of a protected uh, uh, place or aspect. Um, um, but protection with honesty. There was never any denial about what was difficult out there. But, Within the family, um, and I'm talking about an extended family, there seems to always be time for, uh, for the children. Well, I think that's why I do not carry uh, some of the very uh, bitter feelings, because I did not hear. I heard what was wrong, but it was not done with uh, rancor mm -hmm. and anger. Well, it's often the child who has been loved that is then most free to, to explore and to, to chart new paths right. as an adult. Yeah. I think that was very true. And um, I think the um, idea that you can or should do something about your own situation um, was, was so very uh, much a, a value in, in the family that, um, that in spite of obstacles you were supposed to you know, try to achieve. One of the uh, occupational hazards of social work and human services is burnout. It's tiring of, of all the concern and dealing with all the obstacles. What do you think makes your life different? Because you've overcome, you've persisted, and to this day you remain um, somewhat, I think, of an idealist uh, in profession. I guess that's true. Um, I guess the burnout, uh, part of it, I think, has been, when I look over uh, the various things that I have done, I think in some ways the burnout comes when there's um, the feelings of frustration about what you're trying to accomplish or what you're trying to do outweigh or are more excessive than the sense of feeling some success. And some of that, I think, is just in terms of the length of time that I had any one specific assignment. I think that's one thing that helped to cut down on that. Not that I have not felt uh, pressures and stress at, from time to time. I think um, the short term um, of most of the assignments I had, even within the county, I had variety. Mm -hmm. And in most instances, I did show, I did the things that I felt comfortable about doing. I always said that if I'm not comfortable in this assignment or this job or whatever, I will find something else. Mm -hmm. And it's been very interesting. I think that that has kind of followed through um, with me. Um, and even now, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that um, I wonder, I mean, if I could do all those things, uh, what really happened? And um, um, then again, I think it was also the kind of support I had with people, mm -hmm. the other people that I worked with. For the most part, I did not find myself in positions which I think really contributes to burnout, where there is conflict, a heavy amount of conflict mm -hmm. in the administration. Well, it's no accident if you were supported by your administrators and colleagues. There must have been things that you did to, to develop a, a working relationship. That's true. That's true. In fact, I, um, when I was sort of beginning to make decisions about uh, retirement, which comes with age no matter what, um, I had very few people that I had worked with or for that I really felt we were just constantly in disagreement. Might have had different ideas, 
uh, but I think the acceptance uh, part, on my part, the acceptance of people that I may not have necessarily agreed with uh, was was uh, was an important thing. The acceptance to the point of really trying to understand them. Maybe I did not condone what they did, but I felt uh, I feel that that was a, a really an important thing, and that is uh, really probably had been so grounded with some of the social work principles. Um, the second thing, though, I think is having other interests. Not being uh, completely, totally, you know, your whole life is tied up in, quote, a job. Mm -hmm. um, I found this was true in the last years when I worked at Pepperdine. Uh, politically, uh, and in terms of attitudes and values, I could I could have constantly been uh, at war. I could have found somebody to fight with. So, uh -huh. uh, but um, I, I seem to be able to find the people where we could work cooperatively together. And the second thing was that I had um, a diverse life. I had family. I had my children. I had other colleagues. My social work colleagues were all there, not necessarily on the job. And I think that was a very different kind of experience, um, you know, in, in, a, in a career like this. That's a very good point. A lot of times the people that create the most unhappiness in the work setting also have the fewest friends and, and uh, family members that they can enjoy outside the work setting. That's true, that's true. So they hold, the whole, they work out all of their <laughs> life experiences and needs, uh, you know, in that one thing. Mm -hmm. There's a question about uh, changes in the field of social work. Mm -hmm. Looking at the way things are today, contrasted with what the field of social work was like when you first entered the field. Mm -hmm. How would you, what differences would you see between the field now and uh, when you started? Well, you know, it's, I think the thing that is really most exciting about the field, looking at it now, is um, where it's come from. And where it is now, even though there's still questions and people do uh, make a lot of stereotypical statements, uh, it, it's almost social work as a practice, as a way of working with people, it has gained a tremendous amount of respect. Um, and um, many groups, um, in some ways, almost envy what social work does. When I came into the field, it was sort of like uh, terms like do-gooders and um, when you get all that knowledge, but when you come back here to work, you uh, forget that and do the job. There was a kind of um, derogatory or putting down of social work, uh, both by the profession as well as by um, other groups. Now, sometimes with that, when uh, I think people who felt uh, better than any other person who was delivering services are doing things. But what I see today is um, the way the knowledge base and the um, kinds of contributions that have been made by social workers has expanded two directions. One, within the field and the educational qualities and qualifications that have been developed. And at the same time, uh, making it an essential part of um, just, uh, human knowledge and human concern. I don't think you, instead of really pulling back or uh, moving within, we're now cutting across what resources in the industry uh, and people are using the knowledge and what social work offers in a, a variety of creative ways. Um, at the same time, um, there is probably um, not as much that is happening that is developing um, some of the things that we think about in terms of social action and social change um, and community organizations 
um, group work, social work is not, we do not feel, I do not feel that there is as much development in that area that is across the board. The principles are there and people do things, but I think it's, um, it's, it's uneven. So in some ways, you know, I'm speaking with, what would you say, fork tongue, that on one hand there are some really exciting things going on and then there are some lags. So, but I think the big thing about the, the profession is that it's very dynamic, um, and there seems to be more of a move um, for making it a profession that stands on its own as compared to being dependent on uh, agency systems. It almost has to. Yeah, in some ways, I think the, the status or the recognition of a profession is related to the population that profession works for. Yeah, and that's for true. a long time, social workers have been identified as those who work with poor people. That's right. And, and over the years, uh, I think as you described, the, the profession has gained more respect because of its ability to work with people from all different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, the national priorities seem to be fewer resources for poor people. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that's where... Um, some of the um, concern um, that I have about, you know, what has happened in the profession. I guess I'd like to see more leadership uh, from the profession. But on the other hand, um, you know, you have to sort of deal with, with where people's priorities are and what they have uh, feelings about. I think one of the areas that I'd like to see uh, more social work, professional social workers involved is in the, um, dealing with some of the issues uh, such as in the criminal justice system where there may be a few but it's uh, there there are not that many um, some in terms of looking at some of the really challenging concerns not only dealing with poor people but also dealing with I, I would say some of the critical populations when you look at uh, uh, substance abuse and some, some of those kinds of issues that people are facing. Social workers are there, but I think what has happened is that um, um, in terms of economics and survival, they're not always on the cutting edge. And I really can't speak for that because I'm not in direct service, but I feel that I'm close enough to it to see that, that that's probably one of the signs that I'd like to see. Well, what, what do you think we as a profession need to do to develop more leadership for people on the cutting edge? Probably uh, to help people struggle with as individuals uh, some of the issues around advocacy. I think we, we know them and we are aware of them, but sometimes in our emphasis on what has really made us more popular, which is the clinical understanding behavior, being able to work in settings where you're not the hostess or the host, but being able to work in those settings, I think, has um, put us in a kind of a different position. But we still need that other side, which is kind of where I came into social work, being concerned about the advocacy. For on behalf of people who uh, uh, either toward uh, empowerment, which is something that, uh, or toward doing something to help uh, change uh, the kind of situation that we all live in. Um, and that, that's one of the things that I think I have seen change on behalf of people who uh, uh, either toward uh, empowerment which is something that, uh, or toward doing something to help uh, change uh, the kind of situation that we all live in. Um, and that, that's one of the things that I think I have seen change is the um, emphasis on changing individuals, which was very heavy in, in my training as I think back. And... Um, I think I had the advantage, as I told Norris class once, that I came, went to USC every decade. So I got a little bit of, <laughs> of 
each of the teachings, so I'm, I'm not that, you know, I don't go back to an original kind of thing exclusively. But the other side is the kind of thing that, uh, the whole concept of empowerment, which I remember when uh, Barbara Solomon's book first came out. There was, uh, I read in one of the uh, magazines or something about we're not even clear about how to define this word. And now it's become a part of the everyday rhetoric. And I, But I think that the thing that is interesting is that, that now everybody's kind of taking that on and social work is still in that role of um, we started it, but somebody else has picked it up. That's right. And moved with it. And, and I, don't, I don't know, um, you know, what, what we need to do or how to deal with that. But I think that that's an example of what's very challenging for us. Um, Just to digress for a moment, you're mentioning uh, Mr. Class. Uh, about five years ago, I, I wrote a letter to him, found out where he was in Kansas. In Kansas, Kansas yes. And Francis Feldman gave, got his address for me, and I wrote him uh -huh. a thank you note. I, I had him from my policy instructor. Okay. This is in 1970, 1971. Okay. okay. And I wrote to thank him for what he taught me because as I've done more and more in the field now and moved away from direct practice to dealing with policy issues mm -hmm. with the legislature, I can appreciate how important it is to have one important law that's passed that could affect Many, many people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, he was really one of my first, earliest professors, him and John Milner. Mm -hmm. um, go uh, to that. Uh, but it, it, when you mentioned Kansas, you know, I was born in Kansas. And I have a cousin who lives there who's a court reporter. And um, I mentioned that one of my professors had moved to Topeka. And when I told him his name, he was so excited. Mm. But he's a professional court reporter, and he had worked on a committee with North Platt, had known him personally, and his wife and um, uh, uh, Mr. Class's wife were friends mm. uh, politically. They had worked on some political things together. And it was just like a full circle. They could not believe that this was the same person that I was. Mm. Re referring to, but he did have that special kind of thing that would, you know, make you think and also make you very conscious of um, policy issues. I got a letter back, not in his handwriting, and I started, as I started to read the letter, I thought, no, this is written by his wife, mm -hmm. and I thought that he had died, mm -hmm. but fortunately, he was writing the letter for him, mm -hmm. because he was unable to write. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. But, but it, um, I did not visit him back there. Uh, I didn't get to spend any time when I was there because I, I guess this, by the time I knew he was there, and when I finally made a trip back, he had uh, he had passed away then. But uh, he was really just a very uh, special kind of person, which is sometimes I think one of the things we miss now in the field there, uh, when you think that there are, what, generations of us who, um, you know, had that exposure, um, that, that I think is another special thing. So I suspect uh, years from now people will be talking about uh, Dr. Elder <laughs> oh, who uh, knows? In, in much the same way as we remember other people. Yes, yes, yeah, I, th I think that's true, that's true, and uh, uh, when you think over time and... Um, in terms of all the, the things that have happened. See, that's the exciting thing about the archive project. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not talking about how many buildings you built or how many mm -hmm. tens of millions of dollars you earned. Mm -hmm. It's really the difference that you've made in the lives of people. That that today and tomorrow will be those that influence policies and then people want. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I think that this is probably a, the other side or the other special thing that um, for me looking at the profession where leadership steps have been taken such as uh, preserving um, information and um, doing the, um, the special thing in relation to the archives and then expanding it in a in more depth to looking more at diversity 
um, which, uh, you know, there's always something, one, something else that needs to be done or something that um, can improve, and yet it's kind of spiral because some of the very early things that were very important to us are now important again. And I think this, the, the whole thing of the issues around um, health care reform and uh, various things are there. The way in which the professional organization has grown and emerged, I think, is, is uh, one of the things to, that we might think about when we... I used to think all of NASW was just Los Angeles, the Los Angeles chapter, and then now a state, and then when you see it on a national and international basis, it's really... Uh, that's one of the big changes, I think, that you see uh, in terms of people and the fact that that in spite of the kind of materialistic me to uh, me generation, uh, that there are still there are young people who are interested in the field. Speaking of young people in the field, uh, do you do you know Carol Williams? Yes, yes. She's back in Washington. Yes, she, yes, you know, yes, yes, yes. She's probably one of the highest ranking social workers in uh, in, uh, in the uh, federal. Yes. Uh -huh. Right. Yes, I talked with her when she was here. Was it early in the spring? I think she came and talked to a group, and especially in terms of the issues around children. Mm -hmm. um, I knew her father oh. and mother. Uh, her father was especially was an attorney, mm -hmm. and quite. And I met him in the field of aging, mm -hmm. and it was interesting to know how. What uh, quite he was quite an advocate, and uh, when they went back to. Uh, live with her, I know that um, her mother uh, had uh, Alzheimer's, which was very, very good, and that he made the decision to move to be with uh, the daughters, uh, which uh, she was, I think they were either, one was in Africa, Carol was not, but Carol's sister was in Africa, and then, uh, so he went to the East Coast, but I, I remember watching her come through and going to being at UCLA and mm -hmm. all of that. So, you know, that is, is really very good. So I guess numbers have come through um, um, social work. Yeah. You know, speaking of that, within my own family, my daughter-in-law is a social worker. Oh, really? Uh, she, um, in fact, she was completing her master's when she met my son, and they so the did. one in Boston? No, this is the one in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And she was at Southern, and uh, she got married. They got married, she and my son. And when I talked with her mother, we were both saying, well, maybe she should finish her degree until they said nobody, had, they didn't ask us. <laughs> so, <laughs> but she uh, is working uh, now in Dallas with um, substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And, uh, before she married, um, I met her at a conference in New Orleans, and uh, we spent some time together, and then I said, oh, why don't you go with me to this affair? And she said, uh, she didn't know whether she said, I'll either make it or I won't, because she, I knew so many people uh, there in social work. But she has, has a, real, a real commitment to uh, working uh, mm -hmm. with families and children in, in social work. So uh, that's it. Way. But um, so the younger the younger generation coming on is doing a lot. Mm -hmm. But that's because of the, the training and the sharing of values from either how are you? Well, belated happy birthday to you. Because she got blue instead of giving her flowers at church, they gave. Huge a bouquet of balloons uh -huh. and all oh, they had so many things and the children brought her flowers and uh -huh. so she said so we had a had quite a That's so part of the tradition. I mean, it's it's you and your mother with eighty eight. You're in the same house. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. We had, and I don't think uh, in our planning that we necessarily saw ourselves being in the same house, but we've always been uh, very close. And I, I jokingly say that I'm the first 
paid social worker in the family. Uh, and some people were introducing themselves and what they had done and all of that. I uh, thought about how I saw people being helped or there was a kind of a supportiveness that came out of that community that I grew up in. And in uh, living in small little town, and Salina was considered a little city. Uh, the town where I was born was a very small town. It was around the town square. And my godmother, uh, who lived there, uh, was sort of like everybody came. They had a minister there about every once a month, uh, so that the whole thing was a place where you could, uh, you would always be received or, or helped in some degree. And I think that's what's kind of kept me stuck to the profession and very, um, very involved. Well, it's a real uh, privilege to be able to hear your story uh, firsthand. And, uh, I've seen you before and certainly seen your name around, but it's, uh, it's pretty special to be able to talk to you about uh, your life. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciated this chance to talk about it. You know, um, you don't, re you have to sit down and think a little bit when you're asked these kinds of questions, and you're used to asking other people. That's right. To you're tell you're you the yeah, that's a, so that it uh, this sort of turns the tables, you know, uh, uh, to get uh, to get this kind of information. So we we do have a very. Um, very rich uh, heritage uh, in the field. Well, Marva Walter is, um, was a very skilled interviewer mm -hmm. often ended her interviews with a question and maybe I'll ask you that mm -hmm. now and mm -hmm. she would often say, well, I've asked her lots of questions and it's going to be almost over, mm -hmm. but uh, what question should I have asked her? Should you have asked her? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, when I think about it, uh, and, and see, I, I'm, I'm biased because, see, I know about these questions. I know something about how they evolve. So I think that uh, I can't think of anything um, special uh, that we didn't uh, cover in terms of questions. Uh, and I, I know my own tendency and that is I tend to accentuate the positive uh, more than the negative, and that's always put me in good stead uh, so that um, I would um, I would say that you did a good job. Well, thanks a lot. If there were people listening to this tape say, 20 years, 30 years from now, any thoughts you might uh, pass on to them about what you think would be real keys to to advocacy, to uh, to doing things for people that can't do things for themselves? Well, you know, it, it uh, I take a little thought, you know, but I think probably one of the most uh, critical things is to be sure that. Uh, what is being done or what is being advocated uh, does not lose sight of the human quality of people and uh, the human capacity and that it does not um, take advantage of one group over another. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I think has seems to keep emerging in our society, that one somebody has to sort of stand on or step on or use as a whipping boy or scapegoating uh, another group. Uh, and I'm not just speaking racially, but if it's not children who are being um, abused in a lot of sense, uh, the elderly are then looked upon, or people who do not have the capacity to do for themselves. So that I think the critical thing would be to be sure to keep the human quality in mind and the, the resilience of human beings. And beyond that would be the respect for the individual, for the person, which is, is so uh, important. And um, really, uh, I guess the thing that I'm much most conscious of now is the way power 
is used in our society. So I would just hope that it would be judicious and with uh, some humility. There ain't very good point. Well, today is November the 22nd, yeah. and it was, I believe, 32 years ago today that uh, President Kennedy was shot. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I thought about that as I was coming back from the meeting today, and guess where I was? At a social work meeting. Mm -hmm. Over a Jewish... Um, Family and not family service, but um, uh, the Jewish Federation over um, off of Olympic in San Vicente, mm -hmm. where they all come together. Five old five building. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, no, not that one. Uh -huh. oh, this is before. This is right. It comes kind of in a point there where San Vicente, mm -hmm. Olympic, and um, Fairfax all kind of come together. Mm -hmm. That was the sort of the group work. Center for uh, various Jewish organizations and agencies. They had swimming, they had a lot of group work services. And um, Gertrude Wilson was speaking. This was a workshop, and I was sitting in that meeting at that time when she came and made the announcement, uh, the, the beginning of that. And it was just like it, everybody was just put into a state of complete shock. Um, uh, it was just, um, um, people could not believe what had happened, but I remember so vividly that I was actually there at a, um, at a, at a meeting um, in social work, um, and it was a workshop, um, and I had, a, I, don't I had a course, I was doing something with Elizabeth McGoon, and supervision, but I, I remember that um, very, very vividly. Many years later, we used to go into homes with the psychiatric emergency team, and, and many, many families. I was struck by the number of times I saw pictures of John Kennedy and his brother mm -hmm. on people's um, walls. The tables and around here. Mm -hmm. and it, that was just like a very personal member. Mm -hmm. Of the family uh, for for people in that time, and, uh, and I think it made a special kind of impression on uh, on people throughout throughout the community, throughout the world. You know. It's uh, very unbelievable. I, for the first time, went to the site in Dallas. I had not been there about mm -hmm. uh, three years ago, and uh, it. Uh, still, you know, carry that tremendous impact on people. This is a day, huh? And you realize the tremendous impact a person has. Mm -hmm. And really, our profession has to do with people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And even though we've lost some outstanding people in this country, some outstanding leaders, you know, the Kennedys, uh, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. um, Somehow people have, have been resilient and as a country and as a profession, I think we've really It comes, come back. comes, comes back, and I, I think that's the faith that you, you have. Um, um, I think working outside um, profession, you know, working at Pepper Guy, that was one of the things that interested me. One of the people who talked a lot said he really missed the fact that he didn't have the opportunity to become a social worker. Uh, he would become a psychologist and he was a marriage and family, like marriage and family counselor, and did a lot of things for him to the basically what he really was interested in, but really didn't know the field was um, in, in social work, which is sometimes, I think, um, something that we have forgotten as a, uh, as a profession. Um, much of it. Beginning, um, I was so interested that I found out that Mrs. Fever mm -hmm. was given millions, you know, she had billions, millions of dollars. She died, what, a couple of, uh, two years, a year ago, and they had a special memorial service. She had been a child in Chicago, 
that had gone to the uh, center uh, for uh, to learn to play the piano. And this was through the whole the services provided in that agency mm -hmm. um, back in the, you know, here she, this woman died at 100. And she had, and so that's part of where her philanthropy came from. I had never realized that, because mm -hmm. she she's the last person in the world you thought would have given standing room any social work. Uh -huh. She didn't talk about social work, but she was talking more about the settlement house, mm -hmm. the settlement house concept. And that's where she got her start in terms of someone taking time with her. And that's where she learned her music. She later, you know, they, they I think they were considered the most generous in terms of individual givers to education um, in uh, in California. You know, they, every school, USC, um, the, uh, engineering, uh, now uh, at Pomona College, um, there were all there were just numerous places, and the Pepperdine was one that was done after her husband died. She was upset with the policies and what everybody did at some of the other schools. And that's when she came to Seaver, that's when they named the school Seaver College. Oh, uh, what is it there? But now he was right on the edge. He was on the cutting edge mm -hmm. of that. Uh, he was both down here and also out at Kirkland. Uh, and I, that was a very, he was truly a politician in terms of um, being creative, acquiring money, and like keeping between the balance between the I didn't realize that how many of the faculty felt he was too far, too far out. Uh -huh. uh, they didn't think he was conservative enough. And uh, so I, I haven't heard about him recently, but he has been, he uh, was in Oklahoma all around. But she, he was part of the group that kind of wooed Mrs. Seeker into the contributing which uh, was just amazing. And when I heard about her early background, which people had not heard before, I thought, well, not there are social work. That's right. <laughs> right in there. Well, yeah. thank you very much. It's been a okay. real gratifying well, experience. Good. And, uh, very good. I certainly appreciate it. I know you're glad to kind of get closure on some. These are hard to get pinned down and to do uh, these kinds of interviews. Which, I, this was the second one for me, and I, uh -huh. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Good, good. Who did you do the first one? Uh, Meyer Elkin. Oh, sure. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, good. that's good. But yeah, you're right. It's hard to kind of get things finalized and right. make phone yeah. calls. And you just have to be persistent. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And it takes real persistence. Well, thank yeah, you so much. Well, you're welcome.